Um, my name is Desiree Mobed, and I'm the executive director. Together with the Alden Kindred Board of Directors, we preserve and share the legacy of Mayflower passengers, John and Priscilla Alden, and their homestead in Duxbury, Massachusetts. This is the first of a series of virtual programs that we will be presenting during this 400th anniversary of the Mayflower journey and founding of Plymouth Colony. Visitors to Alden House are fascinated to get beyond the myths of the pilgrims and learn more about the details of their daily lives. In this book, J.L. Rose, who is from Duxbury, um, masterfully blends a little history and fiction to weave together a story rich in detail, drama, and a little romance. She takes us into the lives of a small group of religious dissenters in England and then Holland in the years leading up to their famous voyage. As we get to know some of the well-known pilgrims like Bradford and Brewster, who became neighbors of the Aldens in Duxbury and understand more about why they embarked on their famous voyage. After this talk, we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into your Facebook chat. And we also invite you to share your feedback about this program by, and suggest other programs that you'd like to see. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to JL Rose and before the Mayflower. Hello, <clears throat> hello everybody. I uh, hope you're all doing well, and uh, no matter what part of the world you're viewing this from. Exciting if you're in the Netherlands or uh, friends in England, I'm happy to present to you. And I'm, I'm just grateful that you have, have a common, share the common interests in this historic, um, in this topic. So today is May 1st. And when Desiree and I were talking about the day to present, I actually requested May 1st. And the reason I did was because it's not only May Day, but um, in the city of Leiden in the Netherlands, where the group that we'll be talking about um, did reside for more than a dec decade, May 1st marked the start of rents for a new year. So if you were renting, which most of the, that group did initially in 1609, so 411 years ago, uh, they would be starting anew. And, and that's a parallel I think we can draw quite clearly to what we're facing today. Um, the, the idea of, of hope and uh, rebirth, it's springtime, uh, there's hope in the air. So uh, I appreciate you joining me today and sharing your time with me, and we will get started. I'm going to share my screen, have a set of slides, excellent. So there's a lot going on in this initial slide. I'm going to start the clock here so we don't run over. So on the left, you see the cover of my book, which Hendrik Averkamp, the painter from the 17th century, so graciously allowed me to use. This painting hangs proudly in the Rijksmuseum, which is where I'm standing on the right. Um, this is one of the most um, comprehensive uh, museums in, in Europe and the world. I'm proud to say that my book is, is sharing this, this painting for the cover. So I'm smiling so brightly there because I've just come from a meeting with the bookshop manager in the, within the confines of the Rijksmuseum. And Mr. Damala, a lovely, lovely man, has agreed to carry my book there. So what a dream come true to have my historic novel gracing the shelves uh, within the Rijksmuseum. The other picture I want you to take note of is in the center, that is me. Back in 2015, I was fortunate enough to uh, be hired by Plymouth Plantation, and I worked in the 17th century village as an interpreter. Um, there, portraying someone who did exist, Sarah Godbertson, and I was always fortunate. I worked two seasons, and I was always portraying somebody who did stay in Leiden. But take a look at the clothing. Um, look at look at my my petticoat. Uh, look at my waistcoat, which is the pinkish color. And my hat is a brown color, if you can't tell. The, the petticoat is more of a gray. So see how there, there are a couple things missing of the 
of the stereotype of the quote unquote pilgrim. Um, you don't see a buckle and you also see I'm not wearing any black in there. So just take note of that as we go through the, the presentation. Um, that's one of my main points and what, what I cite as one of the common misconceptions. So before we um, get into the rest of the slides, I just want to explain what you will find if you delve into the pages of my novel. What you're going to find is not only history, but you're going to be taken back and thrown into the period, going into the details of daily life of the 17th century. So I'm going to kind of sneakily teach you not only history, but what people were wearing, eating, um, major events in life that we all can relate to, uh, births, marriage, death. You'll, you'll get a, a close-up view of how all these things transpired. The book itself, where can you find it? Well, right now we're, we're pretty much set uh, quarantined and uh, shelter in place for most of us. So you're not gonna be going out. Amazon makes it easy. If you like Kindle, there's that version. Um, and then I'm fortunate enough to be in the, these physical places. Once we can resume um, traveling, you could find the book there. That picture is, I'm so proud to show, in the shop at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. You can also visit my site and see some fantastic pictures from my research trips. And note that I will be donating a portion of the proceeds um, to the historic institutions that we want to keep um, afloat. So I'll quickly go over this, why the pen name? Uh, JL Rose is not my real name. So Rose is my middle name though, I'll give you that. So there is some meaning there. Rose is my middle name because my mom's name was Rose. So she, she has that honor of being in, in part of the pen name. And J and the L stand for my twins. Uh, Jade on the left, who also is involved at the plantation, as you can see. And my son, Luke. And they were born after I started this project. So they're twins and they came into this world extraordinarily early, three months. Um, and then in the midst of them coming home, my, my mother was um, struck by, suddenly by pancreatic cancer. So I, I did lose her uh, within a year of that. So this is tribute to, this is tribute to survival. This is tribute to um, resilience. And that connects directly to the people we're going to learn a little bit about. And so, so why did I write this book? Number one, I had a dream to write a valuable historic fiction. I really enjoyed Tracy Chevalier's uh, Girl with a Pearl Earring. Happens to be the same genre uh, time period. She wrote about Vermeer. I'm writing about some of the people who ended up on Mayflower. But why did I do it? because there's a lot of value in knowing the truth. And the biggest reason is there's more to the story. Um, not just my story, there's other people I've been working with. There's so many stories out there for us to enjoy that we haven't heard yet. Amazing, uh, and 400 years have passed. So what does this cover? This novel covers the, the years 1587 to 1620. So you have more than three decades and What's important for you to know is in reading the book, you're not just going to hear about dates and events that occurred. You're going to hear about the important supporting details. Things like what people wore, what colors, what types of materials, what did they eat, uh, major events. What you might wonder, how did they transpire? Birth, marriage, death. How did people cure themselves if they found themselves ill? Who was involved? What were relationships like? What were women's roles like? Because their voices are lacking so much in primary sources. I gave them a voice. I let William Brewster talk, talk to Mary and, and we hear their exchange. We hear their concerns. Where? England and the Netherlands. So I've had some people be very disappointed that I don't cover the journey, but it is before the Mayflower. So we end up uh, ending things in the English channel. I won't go into too many details. And so we'll get into the who and the how, the research I'll describe. So 15 years it took, uh, it took a lot of time for a number of reasons. But when you do something like this and you're trying to do it right, 
there's a lot of steps you have to take and there's a strategy. Right, so we're going over um, the process of research and just explaining how there's a system and there's a strategy. So books were step number one and rare books. Um, I went to Brown University, found some fascinating information, mostly primary sources, uh, but then also there are some people on this planet that are dedicated to this history that I, I found, I hunted them down and convinced them I was worth talking to. So I traveled the novel's path, um, starting in England. So the book begins in London, we'll get into that in a bit. And then uh, spent a lot of time in the Netherlands in Leiden, which was absolutely uh, fantastic. And I went back probably seven or eight times. So I worked with the experts in the history and I finished up kind of came full circle, um, which was such a necessary step, I think, working as an interpreter at the plantation. Because not only did I get to live in the quote unquote period, I dressed, I ate, I cooked uh, items of daily living, but more importantly, the people, it always comes back to the people, doesn't it? I think that's why we're having such a hard time with this quarantine. The people and the experts, the experts in clothing and food ways, just a fantastic opportunity. I had seven peer editors. so. I wanted to make sure these facts were right. So let's get into the common misconceptions. We already touched on the pilgrims, as we call them, by the way. They wouldn't have referred to themselves as that. Always wore black. Not the case. The reason being is black was by far the most expensive color that you could purchase. Um, if you're a group of people that are trying to venture to the new world uh, for a chance at a better economic situation, which we'll come to find out was a major part of it, um, you're not wearing black every day. If you're wearing black every day, you're part of the upper class. Um, and, and this was not these people. So what are they wearing? Look in the painting. Look, we, we are blessed with a snapshot of the period from Avercamp. And you can see all sorts of colors. You can see blues and yellows and you can see all walks of life, which is the other fantastic thing about this picture, because how often do you have people from, you know, peasants to the elites in one small space? So you can see a variety of colors, reds, yellows, things, greens, blues made of, you know, plant-based dyes that would be um, more economically viable for somebody of the lower middle class. The buckles on the hats and shoes, I have no idea how that came to be. Um, absolutely incorrect. Not that there weren't buckles that existed in the period. Um, they would, you would have that on your a girdle or a belt, let's say. But the shoes and the hats, you would have had a hat band of some sort of textile material. And the shoes you would have had, so, uh, again, more of it. It would be a tie, tied, tied material, whether it would be leather or linen. Um, like string. So no, no buckles. Get that out of your mind. Um, you'll see it on the mass turnpike and I cringe every time I go under one of those signs. So let's uh, just cover the others very quickly and then we'll get into the detail. So they were all Puritans on the ship Mayflower. Not the case. Um, they were all uneducated and poor. Absolutely not. We'll, we'll explain that and who in particular attended university. Uh, one thing that shocked me, they all knew one another on the ship. So I have to thank uh, Randall Charlton is the son of Warwick Charlton, who um, created Mayflower 2. He's the father of Mayflower 2. And it was there on Mayflower 2 during a visit that I came to the decision that this was the topic um, that would capture my my dream and my objective to write a book. Because during that visit, I found out that there were a group of people that spent more than a decade in the Netherlands, unknown to me, and I grew up in Massachusetts, so that's frightening. And then two, I assumed everybody came from the same place and knew, knew each other on the ship. This was one solid band of you know people, one group, not the case at all. Uh, so this book, my novel, focuses on the people who spent their preceding years in the Netherlands. So they all uh, ventured to the new world only, only for religious freedom. Absolutely, 100% incorrect. So let's talk about where and when, which is very important. So maps, I think, are helpful. Let's get perspective. So as you can see, the arrow there is that is pointing to Leiden, about 25 miles south and west of 
Amsterdam, and then across the North Sea to the West. You'll see London with the green star, up north to Scrooby with the blue, and yellow Southampton. So let's get some visuals. The book starts in London, England with William Brewster. He carries you throughout the entire story. You're, you're with him and ultimately his family and his congregation from the beginning to the end. He's a young man at the start and surprisingly, maybe not to some, but to me, he went to university, was very well educated and then also worked for the Secretary of State who uh, served under Queen Elizabeth I. So he was amongst um, some dignitaries. He traveled to the Netherlands at a young age. Um, so well-versed in academia and politics. So ultimately he will move up to Scrooby Manor. That's St. Wilfred's you see uh, in the middle to the right. And then part two of the book brings you over to my favorite place, Leiden and the Netherlands. You might see the two spellings. So in 17th century, it's spelling was how it sounded to you. So as far as I'm concerned, they're both correct. And we get into the role of the printing press, which to the period, to the people in 17th century would have been relatable to us now with what we have in the way of the internet. So the press is its own character in this book and it links William Brewster to my fictional family. Let's get to the players. So William Brewster and family, as noted, leading uh, your tour back in time. And then other prominent figures that you'll come across, Pastor John Robinson, William Bradford, who becomes the second gover governor of Plymouth Colony, the first being John Carver, and Edward Winslow. Wealthiest of the congregation, that's Carver. We don't know a whole lot about him, but I can tell you he was very important. On the fiction side, we have linking the two, I should say, the printing press, as I stated, I think of it as its own character. And you have Nicholas Oakes, master printer, who resides in London and stays there. And then we have, let's call him, I don't want to call him the villain, that's not very nice, Hugh Mercer, who works as a post carrier in the King's Post. So in that period of time, the post carrier was obligated to carry post only uh, for official business and only for the government. So you or I could not send letters. So having him as a friend, you can see would be quite useful. Thomas Brewer is somebody that we should get to know, but we don't know him and I don't want to spoil the book, but he was very wealthy also. He ends up in Leiden and he contributes a significant amount of finances to the congregation. So he's very important that way. And then towards the end of the book, we'll do a little back and forth between London and Leiden as the group negotiates and gets ready to embark on their journey to the new world. So let's get uh, the story straight about they were all Puritans. That's what this slide answers. Were they really all Puritans on that ship? So a little bit of history, religious history. Uh, try to be straightforward. Um, Bottom line is the, the king, queen, runs both the church and the state of the, in the Church of England. Okay, it's run by the government at that time period. Elizabeth I starts with us on, on the journey, and then she passes away in 1603. James I takes over the throne. A throne. Let's be clear, they're both Protestant. There was a lot of flip-flopping prior to that, Catholic, Protestant. Uh, no, it's all Protestant in this book. Let's make that clear. Church of England is Protestant in this time period. So what is the distinction between Puritan and what we would consider our group that fled England and went to the Netherlands? Those who fled England, Brewster, ultimately Winslow, Bradford, they have decided they need to separate from the Church of England. Very different from a Puritan who believes purification is adequate. So the arrow is pointed separatists because Brewster, Robinson, et cetera, were just that. They had separated. They would not have called themselves separatists. Um, that would have been sort of a derogatory term. And in that period, someone who separated from the Church of England was really considered an extremist, I have to say. Um, not conventional, definitely extreme. And it was illegal to separate, and it was also illegal to leave England without authorization or what they called a pass reports. So that was a risky prospect, just leaving England to go to the Netherlands. 
a Puritan was, um, like I said, wanting just reform. So what I mean by that is they thought the Church of England was still too closely linked to the ways of Catholicism and, and wanted more reform, but still wanted to stay within, within the church. So that's a very, very different um, entity than separatism. And then I just note here that both Catholics and separatists would have been considered extremists and certainly threats to the, to, to the throne. So I'll try to go through this quickly because we're getting short on time, but why would you, why if you're Brewster, would you leave England um, and risk your life? If you believe that worshiping God in the, in the incorrect way was what was happening if you stayed in England, to you, it's not a choice. The group that fled to the Netherlands believed uh, they were Calvinists. They believed in predestination. So in their minds, this, was, this wasn't a choice. It was a matter of how can I, uh, how can I worship the way God wants? Um, they had to leave. Just wasn't a choice. So these points speak to that. Um, to separate from the Church of England, though, the, you have your dilemma was punishable by death. Um, but really, if you believed you had to separate because that's what God wanted, then you would believe that if you stayed in England and worshipped in the Church of England, you could have a life, uh, eternal damnation, so beyond the earth. So clearly, it, it was a need. And it was not easy to get out either. I won't get into the details of their mishaps. But there's a story in and of itself, just into talking about the departure from England. So they... Finally, Brewster, Robinson, uh, others, Bradford, get over to Amsterdam. They convene there eventually, and then they decide Amsterdam's not the best place for them. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but there was a group already had separated from the Church of England that was massive, and they had a lot of controversy associated with them. So Brewster, Robinson, they decided the best path for their smaller congregation was to go elsewhere. So they then removed to Leiden, May 1st, 1609. So let's go to Leiden. What's in Leiden that's so, that's so beneficial? Well, you have a textile industry that's re being rebuilt because the city was decimated by the Catholic Spanish in the late 1500s. So they want able bodies and skilled hands. So they're welcome there for that. Um, the University of Leiden, which was incorporated in 1575, is there. So one of the finest universities and still is in all of Europe. Brewster was an academic. Robinson was an academic. Carver as well. And Brewer. You had people in the group that were passionate about books. They were passionate about learning and engaging and debating. So this was a natural fit for them. The pictures are fantastic. I took them on one of my many trips. So the, the church that you see through the archway is called the Huglanza Kirk. Uh, William Brewster does, there is record that he does have a son buried there. I have a scene in the book that captures that. I convinced the caretaker of that church to let me up into the rafters. So the picture to the left is me looking down at the gray slate gravestones within that church phenomenal, just a perspective, you know, you'd never expect to have. The bottom right is a picture of the American Leiden Pilgrim Museum or part of it, one of the oldest homes in central Leiden. And that exists just across the alley from the church that you view here. So what happened while they were in Leiden for those 11 years? Um, some of them purchased homes, many learned Dutch, some were enrolled in the university, John Robinson, for instance, Thomas Brewer, uh, William Brewster did not. Some had successful uh, businesses, Jonathan Brewster, the eldest Brewster uh, child, he was successful in the rib ribbon making trade. Um, William Bradford did well enough, he bought his own house, but the majority in the group uh, were, were poor, I would say, working from sunup to sundown, as Bradford quotes, some went into the military, and some uh, married into Dutch society, and, and many, in fact, would remain in the Netherlands. So why are you leaving Leiden? You're worshiping pretty much as you want. Um, okay, you're not, you're not wealthy by any sorts, but you know, you, some people are getting by well enough. 
I mean, do you really need to, to leave Leiden? Um, you know, some of the people decided to say, and the majority of the people I think believed it was necessary to go. So why? I think the biggest reasons were there was a true sending, so war would, would be happening. Um, the Dutch Reformed Church itself was in chaos, so they were impo imposing some new rules. They had to worship um, in public places granted to them by the town. That was a change. So they were tightening the leniency on um, freedom of worship, you could say, within the, within the city. Uh, there were, you know, the English were losing some of their uh, English ways. And they really, you have to remember, they didn't really want to leave England. They just, they felt like they had to. The children were working um, sun up to sundown, as Brad, like I says, said, Bradford states. Um, so this opportunity was a, a chance to own land, uh, to worship freely, but really to better their economic situation. So they started to talk to different investors about how to finance and strike a deal that would allow them to go over to the new world. So that's what they did. So what did they pack? That is its own interesting question. Uh, look at, at this picture here. This is from the American Leiden Pilgrim Museum. So what's brilliant about that in Leiden is all of those pieces there are actually from the period. They're not replicas. But you can also have a good example of that at the plantation. Um, the plantation shows you know, what they would have brought over. So it was really anything that you see, metal, textile, um, the, the bedding, the bed frames, anything nicely carved, that all would have been brought over from Europe because they didn't have the resources to, to make any of those things, the tools, the time. I mean, they were just trying to survive once they got over. So you can see the, the list of things, all your wardrobe you would bring because your wardrobe held about 75% of your total worth and value. But even thing down to the details of seeds so you could grow crops, you didn't know what you were going to find there. You didn't know what would grow well necessarily. Candles, oil, uh, certainly weapons, everything for the daily life like kettles and pots, books. William Brewster took between two and 300 books with him aboard Mayflower. It's amazing. So we come back to this uh, space here. We talk about how they're not all uneducated and poor by any means. The leaders were very far from that. And you can realize that if you have a group coming from the Netherlands and they're meeting up with other people, then certainly they didn't all know one, each, one another on the ship. The other piece I haven't mentioned here, which is really terrible if I don't. The group from Leiden ended up boarding a ship, a smaller ship, about a third the size of Mayflower called the Speedwell. There were supposed to be two ships that crossed, Mayflower and Speedwell, and Speedwell would stay in the New World for a year and aid in one of their principal uh, intended occupations, which was fishing. This was a merchant venture common thread of everybody aboard who ended up on Mayflower because Speedwell did not go was to own land. And the way they were going to do that was to pay back these investors. Well, pay them back with what? Well, pay them back with goods they would send back, such as fish, timbers, furs, anything that would fetch a price in Europe. So without the Speedwell, uh, that hampered their pro productivity and ability to pay back their debt. But that's another story. So many other pieces to this story. So let's, we're running out of time, unfortunately. There's so much more I want to tell you. Um, one of the things maybe in a different talk um, would be the importance of the printing press and the fact that William Brewster had a hand in printing for two years in Leiden and he was pretty prolific, printed about 18, 19 books to the point where the last few were quite controversial and had him hunted uh, by the king, no less, in, in England, had his uh, officials try to hunt him down. So there's so many uh, exciting details, always more to the story. So here we are, and Hendrik Averkamp, I'm going to finish up here. So have a look at the brilliant painting, and I have circled in red two characters. There's a young man tying a woman's skate. I'm going to read a bit from the book. 
which I'm very excited to do. I was trained at Plymouth Plantation, one of the best places on earth to learn about this history. So I will read to you in dialect and focus on these two characters because they will come to life. The ice was peppered with people and as Jonathan bent on one knee to tie her skates, she found it difficult to stay balanced. One skate was on and tied and the other, he, he still had to lace the leather. She noticed a well-dressed couple to her right sitting on their sled. Perhaps they had taken a ride earlier. The woman seemed disinterested in the man or possibly upset. It was difficult to tell. Rose was more intrigued by the massive red plume erupting from the man's hat. She thought to herself that Jonathan would never wear something like that, even if he could afford it. She looked down at him as he worked so diligently. She favoured the colour of his doublet, that of brown mustard, and his dark brown breeches. His dagger, he had moved it out of his way to the back of his girdle. Jonathan dressed it in a practical way and always looked orderly and tidy, not unlike his father. While he finished tying the skates, she looked up to see a boy running across the ice, grasping a stick. It was not clear whether he was chasing a top or something imaginary. In any case, he was clearly enjoying himself and it made her wonder about children of her own and whether God would bless her with any. Jonathan was finished now and looked up at her with love in his boyish blue eyes. How do the shots in feel to you? asked Jonathan proudly, using the Dutch word for skate and smiling as he looked up at her. The skates are on well enough and not too tight. I think we should try them, responded Rose. So the scene goes on and you continue to see and pick out people in the painting. Um, it's, it's a fun scene. Jonathan is the eldest of the Brewsters and Rose is a fictional character. So she becomes uh, quickly the favorite of a lot of readers because the romance revolves around her. And I think a lot of us can, can relate to that. Um, so I encourage you to go to my site and see some photos of Leiden. Uh, Leiden is absolutely a brilliant place. Um, there's so much more to this story as well. And then you see who settled uh, here in Duxbury anyway. Um, Philippe uh, Delano, uh, he was a Walloon, French speaking. And there's connection there between him. He settled, he ends up in Duxbury, comes over on the fortune, um, the second ship to come. And uh, his, he's related to John Carver's first wife, or, or we believe so. So a lot of rich details and connections, uh, a lot of incredible photographs. And also I encourage you, um, if you have interest in hearing more about this topic, um, reach out to me, go to my site, reach out to me. Happy to talk about more of these aspects in detail. And also working closely with, uh, if you wanna find everything or anything Mayflower, uh, mayflowerproject2020.com, also the same name for Facebook, um, shares the, the stories of courage, optimism, and teamwork. Uh, we all need this right now. We all need uh, some hope um, and to be connected. I think it's just in our nature, um, adaptability, perseverance. Uh, we are in this together. So I thank you for your time and attention, and I hope uh, you learned something new today and come away feeling good about knowing a little bit more of our history. So thank you. Hey, Hal Rose, thank you so very much for this fabulous presentation. And as we've been looking at the comments, and again, we do apologize for some of the uh, video cutting out, um, some technical difficulties, as they always say. Um, but we've had visitors um, from all over the country. As a matter of fact, I noticed one coming in from Hawaii and they're Aldens and Standishes and Delano's and Bradford's and all interested to share this story. So now please, um, if you'd like to ask any questions, please type them in to the chat and we will um, share them. Um, I do see um, one that's come up that asks um, if, um, you know, what is it that you, it has surprised you most about doing this research and learning about this time, these times? 
I think what surprised me the most and what drove me to write about this period was just all the, all the things I thought I knew that were incorrect, just such as, you know, the stereotypical appearance and um, just thinking, you know, everyone aboard the ship was one kind of happy family and just the obvious misconceptions that we have in a period of our history that we, we deem so important, especially, you know, the symbol of the ship and that we don't have a lot of the details right and that we know very little about the prequel. Um, so just, yeah, the, just the very fundamental inaccuracies uh, of what we think we know and then unearthing all these other it, just amazing stories along the way. And can you comment a little bit more about um, the life of women in the 17th century? People are always fascinated about that. You do mention, you know, that it's very difficult, you know, to really find a lot of documentation about their lives. So in your experiences, you know, certainly with the plantation and so forth, mm -hmm. um, a little bit more about um, the life of a woman in, the, in that time period. Right. So... Uh, that's a fascinating aspect of, of this work. Um, the, the women had very strong roles in that as a housewife, you know, you were managing every aspect really of the home, uh, the care of the children, the teaching of the children, certainly the cooking, um, but you were having dialogue with your husband you know, behind closed doors um, about very serious, important matters. And, and I, I suspect that Mary, let's say, take for example, Mary Brewster and William Brewster. Um, he was very well educated, spoke five languages, but he was certainly engaging with her in dialogue and, and they were discussing things together. Now, ultimately he would make the decisions for the family, um, but the, uh, the level of support of the woman, of women in that time period, I think is a lot greater than, than we might, um, might suspect. There are some first person accounts. Um, there are some primary sources out there um, that are useful, but yeah, the dialogue is minimal. So I did my best to make things period correct. And there's a, quite a bit of dialogue in, in my novel. And what about for children? Because it really seems quite a challenging experience. That's another one of the questions. Um, you know, to, un, you know, to go through that, not only the Mayflower voyage, but then, you know, the settlement, the early, the early years of really struggle and a, a lot of hunger and, um, you know, other challenges and setting up a new colony. Absolutely. I mean, there, there, huh, I can't even, this is a whole other topic almost. If you look to the group um, that I focus on, they had, two failed attempts in some cases to leave England to go to the Netherlands and fear Brewster at the time uh, was an infant. The fact that everybody in that family survived and then survived the first winter in the new world is just startling and, and so unlikely. But there's a scene in my book where I'm describing the removal from Amsterdam to Leiden and it, talk, it talks about um, the Brewster children, the girls are traveling together and patience and fear and just their perspective and, and patience's perspective as she departs Amsterdam, which was a bit of a scary place for her because she came from the countryside in North Nottinghamshire. And now she's thrown into, she barely escapes out of England. Uh, her father was imprisoned in England prior to finally getting out. And then now she's in, thrown into one of the, most bustling diverse cities on, on in the world in Amsterdam. Um, and now she's having to remove again to Leiden. And this is all before <laughs> the speedwell and eventually that fit, you know, that fails. And then the Mayflower. So these, these children saw a lot of uh, obstacles and struggles and, the encouraging thing, though, the, where I admire the people, and, and my book is not, is not a judgment call. You know, I'm not writing this to, to give you any perspective of what I think about these people. It's just kind of sharing the facts. But they had to go through a lot. But the, the, the key thing is they believed their path was set. So you have to understand to them, 
it wasn't like they were uh, questioning really what was transpiring in terms of obstacles or strife or struggle. This was what God had intended and that they would prevail. Okay, and another question that we have here is the um, relationship um, between the people who had been enlightened, the so-called saints, and then those who had joined on, you know, to fill out the journey. And how, you know, what's your sense of how that, you know, worked out? Certainly, I'm sure, you know, it was quite challenging on the Mayflower, but also, um, you know, in setting up the colony. Um, in working out that relate those relationships. Absolutely. Uh, ha you have to envision, you know, you have these two, two ships in, in Southampton and, and you have the bulk of the folks from Leiden, um, the English from Leiden. I, I'm, I'm thinking on the Speedwell and then the Speedwell falters. So now you have this whole transition of some people don't go at all. Some people stay in England, some people go back to Leiden, some people get on Mayflower, and then you have now this mixture of people who didn't really expect to be traveling together. Um, they get to the new world and there's no official pastor because John Robinson, the leader in Leiden, he stayed with the bulk of the congregation there as, as was the plan and William Brewster as the elder um, is who he was uh, the elder of the church takes over that role. So now you have somebody from a separated congregation leading this small group in Mount Plymouth Colony. And there are some people who, you know, view him as an extremist and don't really want to worship um, that way. But, you know, it's better than nothing, I think, in, in most cases. It's hard for me, really. I think my, my coll former colleagues at the plantation would have some, some good insight there. But I think there was definitely issue with the fact that there wasn't a Church of England pastor, and here's somebody who had separated trying to lead them. Um, but they were there, and they were sort of stuck with that situation. So I know because, um, you know, most of us are still um, quarantined or shut in, um, you do mention um, a few food items that we can all experience life as, as they would have known it if, we, if you want to try them in your home. Um, one of the more delightful ones, though, would be jumbles. And that's a shortbread cookie, which, um, you know, if you were lucky enough to have sugar, probably wheat flour, rye flour, um, would have been a real treat. So for those of you who really want the recipe, um, you can look for it online. And I think, right, Jen, we can also um, share it um, through um, Facebook and on the website. So look for that recipe to come. Um, any other questions that anyone would like to ask? I'm seeing, um, I think um, people just want to know where to get your book. Oh, right. So uh, Amazon is the easiest uh, before the Mayflower, but be sure to type in a novel because otherwise you'll be directed to a nonfiction book about slavery, which, which is not my book. So uh, before the Mayflower, a novel. In, it's either in paperback or Kindle version. So I appreciate you having interest. And um, again, if you have questions or you want to reach out to me, uh, I, I can be reached through my website and would be happy to give this type of talk or some other specific subject um, elsewhere in the world or uh, country. So happy to share my knowledge. Well, thank you again for joining us today. Um, and also to our board member, Terry Reiber, who's literally been behind the screens trying to help make sure all of this goes against all the competing internet use that we know everyone is, is using. So please, if you have any questions, you have JL Rose's contact information, or you can contact us at Alden House um, at alden.org. And thank you again so very much for joining us today.